Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Tasting in the Dark. If you are not familiar with this show or this format, this is where three of our happy-go-lucky tasters are going to taste through six wines on a blind flight, three whites, three reds. They have 15 minutes to absorb, evaluate, and wax poetic about said wines, at the end of which we will have them review the wines with us. Uh, we will uh, talk in depth about their preferences and some of the things they liked or disliked in the wines, and then we shall reveal favorites. Um, and uh, at this point, should we go through and introduce our, our tortured panelists this week? Uh, Steve, how about you go first? They can't speak. I'm Steve. Remember? They can introduce themselves, can't they? Yeah. yeah they can. The microphones are off. Okay. Steve, go ahead. Didn't I just, wait. Hold on. I have to turn them on. <laughs> Stephen Mirasu, Stephen Kent Winery, Livermore Valley. Pleasure to be here. Looking forward to tasting these wines. I'm Stephanie Dunn, um, right here, Napa Valley, uh, Bittner, founder of Fly Wine, and partner in Justin Vineyard's Emerson Brown Wines and in Massive Consulting. I am Joel Hoechuk from Ame Restaurant in the St. Regis in San Francisco. And I live in Napa, drink a lot of wine, and I'm going to have a lot of fun with us. Excellent. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to count down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Start tasting right now. Hmm. They were all even out of the gates. Did you notice that? I don't see anybody sticking their nose in the wind quite yet, so. <laughs> the first one's always the serious one. After that, you'll see by the wine six, the wheels come off, you know. But really, the first one, you're a little nervous, you know. Those of you at the home audience, uh, I don't believe Joel's accent is actually real. He's been working on it for years. <laughs> is the mustache real? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll have to check if the drapes match the uh, carpet. <laughs> So far, Steve looks like he's been to Cabo before. He's treating those like shots of tequila at uh, Senior Frogs down there, man. I like that. I like that. I know they don't get a good less tasting. You know, yeah. Apparently, our opinion doesn't matter. You know, well, you already know what the uh, you know you've already know you've got taste. You know, um, or a spit bucket. Now, have you ever uh, have you have you ever investigated this uh, when wines taste good app? No. Have you heard about this? The uh, the not. the biodynamics of uh, of wine, where you can have a root day, a fruit day, or a leaf day. Oh have yes, I've heard of that. All right. Do we know which day we're having today, anyone? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the bullpen has officially arrived. So, Christopher, it's your job to talk. Yes. Joel is getting in there now. You know the reason why I brought up that whole website about the fruit leaf, you know, the fruit day, the leaf day, or the root day is we were wondering if, uh, depending on what Joel had for lunch and is still trapped in his mustache, if that'll affect the palate <laughs> of the wines this evening. Um, I think Stephanie's a, a, a great example of how uh, work, study, and uh, and parole can do wonderful things. I think as long as you serve your time to society, I think you're allowed to go back out and mix with the, the general public again. We're certainly proud of her. I think it's been a long journey for her, but I think we're, we're seeing great things out of her. So we have a lot of hope for the future. Um, so uh, Steve, while these guys are tasting the wine, um, maybe now's a good time uh, without obviously talking about the wines that they're tasting. Um, how did you come to be here tonight? I actually brought the wines tonight. Nice, that immediately makes you one of our favorite people in the room. <laughs> um, and where did you bring the wines from? Well, the reason I'm here is because I own a business that is a brokerage, okay. distribution company, okay. and import company. Nice. And Are there lap dances, or is it just... Uh... Uh, by my wife, Faith, yes. Excellent. She's a very understanding <laughs> woman. After meeting you for the last five minutes, uh, she's very forgiving, apparently. Yes. No, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, 
Uh, do you have a, uh, a shop that is a brick and mortar somewhere? Or is it all online no, no, these no. days? We're wholesale only. Wholesale only. Okay. Yeah. So, so we sell throughout California. Okay. And we have a staff of 26 salespeople around California selling our wines. Holy Toledo, man. That is a crew. You keep all these people gainfully employed and out of the rain? Yeah. Fantastic, man. <laughs> um, would you say there is a, uh, uh, what, what got you to this point in the wine business? Did you, did you start out this way wanting to go into wholesale or were you? It's actually been a journey that's lasted over 30 years. 30 years? Uh, I moved from my hometown of Denver, Colorado to Los Angeles to play music. And uh, I actually did have shorter hair at one point. But, um, <laughs> I soon after moving to LA, got a job in a wine shop. It was actually a local tasting room. I graduated to a fancier wine shop in Beverly Hills. And then I decided I didn't want to work weekends anymore, so I went to work for a broker. Um, that broker turned into a well-known California distributor company. And after being like their top sales guy for six years, I went and started my own company in Los Angeles. And in the year 2000, my wife and I moved up to Napa. I had already started a business which was a winemaking venture and I started a new distribution company all over again and my wife is now my partner. Fantastic. Do you, do you sleep ever or is this just something you hang <laughs> upside down for a few hours at night? Like how does this, uh, and how do you convince somebody that they uh, should let you broker their wine instead of somebody else? Well, after 30 years, a lot of people come to us, so... No kidding. A lot of referrals. By the way, self-promotion is a big part of this, you know? We're, we're very much a big fan of that, you know? Let's just spend some time talking about how great you are. <laughs> um, what, uh, what have you seen over the years in your business and brokering and offering wines people out there in the world? Hey, remember you three, 15 minutes, man. You still have to pour your own reds up there, all right? Let's not get too poetic. Um, what, uh, what makes people want to uh, offer their wine through your uh, brokership than somebody else's? Well, it is, of course, competitive. But I it think, is extremely um, out there. A lot of it has to do with personality. Excellent. Um, and Which one in your company actually has one, would you say? <laughs> Certainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you try one on every once in a while? Do you do like a fake <laughs> accent like Joel once in a while? or? You know, today I, we're going to be Dutch. You I know? actually do some good impressions. Nice. But, uh, I, no, no, it sounds like you went to L.A. to play music <laughs> and then you st went immediately into the wine business. So does that mean the music thing didn't work out or the street corner that you were working was already taken? Or how, how did the whole I, music thing kind of evolve for you? I actually fell in love with wine. and uh, From that same street corner? Or um, <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of guys drinking wine out of a bag. You just kind of jumped in? Or how did this all go down? Well, growing up in an Italian family... I was exposed to wine early on, um, but when I was working for one of the retailers in Los Angeles, I had an opportunity to travel to France. This was back in 1984. They still let Italians into France? <laughs> when did this start? Um, and that kind of did it for me. I was like totally in love with the wine regions. And was there an epiphany wine for you in France? Was there that moment where all of a sudden you realized there was a whole new world coming your way? Actually, the epiphany wine was not in France. It was drunk in L.A., and it was a 1959 Chateau Lafitte. Ah, all right. So we're going to start <laughs> there, huh? Yes. Um, a 59 Lafitte in right. L.A., you know? Is that, is, that a, is that a cliche? I mean, a, a 59. How did you it's come a across a 59 Lafitte? I had a friend in Denver who was basically a drug dealer, and he sold to this guy that had a great wine collection that got him into wine, so he brought some wine to California, and we opened it, and we're like, this is fucking great. Now that, uh, now that they've legalized in Colorado, you're regretting your decision moving to California? Not at all. Not at all. No. Not at all. <laughs> is, uh, is your brokership going to include marijuana in the near future? No plans. No, no plans at all. Okay, no. so you're not going to diversify. You're going to stay with the wine thing. We already have Jim Clendenin making <laughs> marijuana-laced Pinot Noir. It, he is not the first to do this, is he? He may be. I don't are, know. Now, are you going to have an actual section of your, uh, of your brokership for dispensary wines? Dispensary wines. Well, that's what they actually call them here Is in California. Like where, wines you know, on tap or something? Well, no, that's actually where you can go in and go, okay, I would like a Northern Lights Pinot Noir or a, you know, a Buddha's Hand a Chardonnay or, a, you know, are you seeing crossing over of strains with certain varietals? Uh, varietals, yes, but not 
So nobody's actually open and notorious <laughs> about the kind of marijuana they're using in their right. wines yet. Yeah. We haven't gotten to that part of labeling yet. Right. All right. Okay. Do you see us going in that direction? I do not. You do not. <laughs> 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 All right, now come on, a 59 Lafitte is not something that happens every day, no matter what uh, the nefarious background of these people. I mean, was this, so Bordeaux was your first experience. That was the one that went, wow, this is different than the other wines out there. Well, this was after, of course, I tasted We're doing the drugs of... that were going on before the wine was, uh, no, it's okay. No, no, no. Um, Bordeaux was definitely my first love. After the 59, where do you go from there? I mean, how do you top that? How do you, what's your next experience from 59? I mean, because oh, they all, they're not all, it's, a, it's kind of a hit and miss game in Bordeaux. So. There were a bunch of, I mean, 71. I did have luck to, you know, taste several Lafitte's and also Margot, Mouton, all the first growths. And then at my wedding, of course, I, we drank a magnum of 76 Mouton. And um, that's our anniversary wine now, so. Fantastic. And how long have you been married? <laughs> Uh, to each other, I mean. Since 01, so that is 14 years. In a row? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Um, and what's your wife's favorite wine? Uh, I don't think we have favorites. We just like to drink good wine. Mm, very, very diplomatic answer, my friend. <laughs> um, what, um, let's see, where are we going with this? Um, Oh, yeah, you, you, you're working in brokership. You've seen wines come and go. You've seen the horrific business model that wineries go through to get their product out there to the world. So did you launch your own label at some point? I certainly did. In what fact, on earth were you thinking, man, you know? Uh, or just go back to the whole drug Bordeaux thing. It, Is that when the idea occurred to you? Um, <laughs> it seemed like the natural progression to me. Because you thought you could do better than anybody that wasn't offering you wine, or it's just different? Uh, no, I wanted to do something different, though. Okay. And I came up with this idea to do a kind of a super Tuscan uh, Ribera del Duero blend. Uh, Say so, all that again? A super <laughs> Tuscan Ribera del Duero blend. Right. So Spain and Italy. So again, skipping and, over France. Yeah. Well, and Cabernet. And Cabernet. Don't okay. forget we're here in Napa Valley. Okay. So you're making stew. Yeah, just everybody's invited so, into the hot tub, man. Like you'll just blend it all together in one big pot and just go crazy. So way before the prisoner ever happened, I was, you know, blending Cabernet, Sangiovese, and Tempranillo. Okay. And uh, just because that was what was left out there to buy in California, or did you actually seek out those? I varietals? actually wanted to do something totally different. Did you shock the first farmer when you walked up to him and said, "I want to buy Tempranillo"? And he was like, "Come on, nobody I, actually wants to buy this in California." I actually had to go to Spain in 1998 and get cuttings back here and have them planted, so that I would have a source of Tempranillo. Did you suitcase them, or did you go through uh, a nursery? Don't I, lie. Every night in the hotels, would soak them in a cold bath. The next morning, wrapped them in wet newspaper in a garbage bag, and then I carried them from Spain. One minute. One minute. Were you closed during this whole experience? I carried them from Spain to Germany, and a German winemaker I was affiliated Strapped with. Strapped to your legs like, like black mailed. hash coming out of Afghanistan? <laughs> like, this sounds like a very nefarious story, man. He actually mailed them back. Really? And they returned to California before I did. He labeled them as umbrellas in case <laughs> they were x-rayed. <laughs> and then with the help of John Alban in the Central Coast. Sure, throw John under the bus. Way to go. He helped us propagate them. We brought them up here, and they were planted. And Explain the word propagation to anybody that doesn't have a thesaurus quickly at their arm's reach here. Well, for any type of fruit plant, you can expand the number of them by grafting buds of the branches onto roots. Gotcha. Is, uh, is a plant infinitely replicatable, or is there a point when it gets exhausted and you have to start with fresh, uh, fresh material? It's infinitely replicatable. Never loses its character, never loses its uh, sort of genetic heritage. You right. can just splice it for forever. Forever, yeah. No kidding, man. That is fantastic. Who, uh, who did you go to specifically for your Tempranillo? To plant it? I mean, was there a specific oh. winery that you tasted and went, wow, yes. I got to have some That's of that? That's actually an important point. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Not to throw them under the bus, too, but as long as you're doing it, let's just get everybody involved. He's you know? considered like the godfather of Tempranillo in Spain, wow. Alejandro Fernandez of Tinto Pescara. Okay. So um, I was visiting him in March. They had Is just... he the one that puts that fishnet stocking over his bottle? <laughs> no, no, no. That's Rioja. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. And... All right, your tasting is officially over. Push the glasses away, pens up, paper away. <clears throat> 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be right back. Hmm. Where'd you get your Sanchevese from? At first, it was a little site that Turnbull owned next to Dalla Valle. Okay. And then Second. after that... Are you still claiming that Bianca is somebody who owned it? Damn. Okay. Uh, but after that, that was a little bit of a American? This was 17 years ago, um, I so, you know, it's right. been a little while. Okay. Or I mm. also went to that John Caldwell, who had a Brunello de Montecino film here in Queensbury. And is, that, is that what he told you it was? Or is it yeah, actually that's what was? That's what he told me. All right. And by the way, are you normally a trusting I, person? I no longer, okay. I no longer uh, use San Giovese in the world. So okay. We'll talk about that. Did you give up on California San Giovese? I did. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and I like oh, sure, you're the last guy holding the flag. Is that, yeah. is that the yeah. one you're going to take? I still believe in San Giovese. Okay. That's one. The third one? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you three, how was the tasting for you? It, it was be. very interesting. Did you, shrug, did you see the shrug of the shoulders on that one right there? Mm -hmm. Is that is that AKA for it sucked or is that uh, AKA for you actually like? <laughs> Are you looking at the jailbird? Oh yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. totally. I learned that move behind. I don't By the way, I love the laser ring, the teardrop. You can no longer really see the shadow of it under the one eye. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love my dermatologist, <laughs> Brett Loftus. Shout out. Uh, works, overall, works it's a five six wines. Let's start with you, uh, uh, Paroli. Um, what, uh, this is not a, this is not a reputation <laughs> or any sort of rumor I need spreading. What, uh, what did you, uh, what Only did you that one time like it was about, uh, um, all, all, Let's talk about your white flight first. There was a, uh, I think this, there was this huge synergy among the flight. I thought they were really an organic kind of style of wines. There was not much flash. One wine showed a little bit of a little bit of leaves. Um, I think they were really very vineyard expressionist. Go back to that last part. Little leaves, like it maybe showed. Some, it, it, it could have been some oak, but it felt like there was some development. But characteristic of the grape, maybe not manufactured. Okay. I thought all the wines were really organic. Like they really kind of just stood for where they were, a like a place, as opposed to winemaker wines. What um, do you mean by tasted organic? Is that is that another? Is that synonymous with lighter in body than than? Mm, maybe there was a great acid component. I think that was fine with all of them. But I just mean like they don't feel too manufactured. That okay. They feel pretty true to where they were, how they were grown and what they were supposed to be. Nice. Varietally correct, huh? I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> we'll I'd, see when you yeah, take we'll the bag off. Joelle, how about you? As a, as a collection of wine, the, the whites and reds, what did you, kind of a, a broad brush stroke on all six? Well, I, uh, I was, the white was really interesting. Um, you know, no. Is this is interesting your it word is, for actually saying you don't really like them, or <laughs> no, what is that actually? No, no, I, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was pretty food forward. Um, you know, the, the first one on the left here uh, was a little light body. Uh, it's been great to drink, you know, with breakfast. Is that light booty or light body? Light body. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent distinction. Yeah. Perfect for breakfast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but pleasant, really, you know, really yeah. pleasant. Something you can drink all day. Uh, when the second one in the middle um, was slightly spicy uh, and that's a very interesting structure. When you use the word spicy, is there a specific spice in mind I mean, that you have um, or just a general No, when I say spicy, I, I do not, actually it's not spicy, but more looking for my world there. Yeah. I've been looking for my world for Use it in minutes. French, it's okay. The people, you know, yeah, they'll yes. figure it out. But, you know, I get back to it. Excellent. You know. And, not, a fruit, uh, not a fruit component to the wine? Something, uh, something yes, non-fruit? Uh, more like aromatic. apricot. But hey, like Steve, one of us is doing the interview. Back off, buddy. Sorry. 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 <laughs> and uh, Chardonnay, the wine on the right, the third one, uh, was, uh, I think, a banker, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, it was a typical uh, flavor for this kind of wine. Yeah. Uh, a white, what was it? A, a kind of what? For this kind of wine, the white, you know, the third white. A banker. You're guessing it was a kind of what? A banker fact, you know. Oh, banker factor, thank you, yes. Uh, yeah. An obvious note in the um, wine that tells you what varietal it is. You know, typical, uh, varietally correct, as you say. Oh, there you go. Uh, and what's pretty yummy, actually. Yeah. All right. How about you? Let's give Steve a chance to uh, wax poetic. He's been, he's been really jonesing down there. That's why I made him go last, <laughs> man. <laughs> um, you know, I... I I, I think that, that oftentimes for me, 
Uh, I think for mo for a lot of people, the word interesting has a negative connotation when it really should have a positive connotation. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm focused on making Bordeaux varietals from Livermore, so I'm immersed in the flavors and aromas of those wines. The self promotion thing we talked about. It's, Please continue. It's <laughs> always a beautiful thing to taste wines that are different than the wines that you make. Yes. And these wines, with the exception of the th of the third white, which I think was the most recognizable to me okay. aromatically, and, and what, what was, was it? Um, it, Cabernet. No, I'm Beside sorry. The white? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Anybody that uh, wants to taste Steve's Cabernet, this um, should be fascinating yes, later when it shows up as a white it's wine. A color challenge. Roll, color challenge. Yes. Um, and, and the reds were the reds were were really interesting flight of wines. I, I, they're they're you know I, I think that my my description of them and my own internal kind of looking at them and thinking about them is consistent with what I think the varietals are, but I probably way off the board. Steve, are you able to taste wine with two different brains? Is there a pleasure brain and an analytical brain where you think you can improve every wine you've ever tasted, and so, then there's some ones where you can just simply turn that switch off and just Great question. It? We were talking about that in, in our tasting lab this morning at the winery. Um, it gets more and more difficult the longer I'm making wine to, to turn it off. Uh, I don't necessarily think about how I would improve someone else's wine, but more about um, um, spending too much time on on defining for me balance, that person's philosophy regarding wood usage or acid and those sorts of things as opposed to uh, the more uh, um, you know emotional connection that we're hoping to make with, with customers of our wines. Um, I, I, it, it's try, I try, but it's, it, it gets hard sometimes. Stephanie, did you say but you also the, made a little wine? What's that? Did you also yes, say you made a little wine? Yeah, but, and, and, but going to Steve's point really quickly, I think that's what makes actually your category of overall impression really challenging. I find it really challenging to go and criticize someone's art when they poured out their vision mm -hmm. onto it. So I have a hard, oh, my overall impression might be, meh. Nah. But <laughs> they had, they were striving for something, right? And somebody out there gets that impression. So I have a really hard time with, I, I couldn't give anything less than one because they accomplished something. They put something out there and in a bottle. And even though maybe it's not what I want to sleep with every night, it's something that they went and had a vision and accomplished. So yes, and I do mostly Napa cabs, but with fly wine, fly dash, wine.com yeah, exactly. um i so, am working and collaborating with yeah. witners all over um who have different visions and we collaborate on the end product for that vision because i think everyone does has their own story and pathway to get to that all right. final product so um you know uh, we're gonna reset to review the wines um look i'm gonna be uh, asking questions about you know you like it you don't like it why and the and the and the etc and uh, with uh, um um, DDA obviously stunted under Joel for the accent, by the way. You would, yeah. <laughs> That's <Excellent>. right. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and, then, and then you'll be talking about the wine a little bit more about the, the background of it. So the first one, the, the, the least favorite of all, is wine number E, or one E. Num so let's reveal this thing here. Can I? E, 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 Stephanie, if you don't like it, Joel, you like it. So uh, why do uh, why you like it, Joel? Um, you know, I like it when I, you know, when I test one, I always think about the food I would have with it. And uh, you know, I would love this one with uh, a duck. You know, a duck. So, you're so when I relax like in my head, I'm, uh, I'm playing this food wine game. Um, and I'm pretty sure like that, on his own, he has a certain characteristic, but you know, if I have it uh, with uh, duck and uh, the right sauce, you would be... Do, do you, would you guess the, the varietal? Hmm? What, what kind of grape is it, you know? Uh, would you guess it? Oh, I think I think it's a Sangiovese. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, about you, uh, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. I was going south of France or something. It feels really hot to me. Um, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of fruit development in it. I love acid, but for me, it's almost like almost, um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's in your gut, that acid in your gut? Um, <laughs> yeah, that, All right, that's that one. So the the one uh, E was the uh, an Hermitage actually, and uh, oh! 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 Oh, the <laughs> south of France, not the south of the Rhone, guys. So, okay. you know, tell, us a bit, um, tell us a little bit about this one here. Uh, mm -hmm. How big of a production this is and, uh, and uh, um, etc. Um, what vintage? 
This is a 2011 Hermitage from the Fayol family, and it's the uh, first time that they've ever been imported to the U.S., and we are the importers. Um, I find that it has a lot of classic characteristics. It has kind of that um, almost kind of bacon fat like Syrah mm -hmm. character right. from the Northern Rhone. I am quite fond of this wine. Uh, the size of their holdings is 36 hectares, which is, uh, it translates to 2.2 acres per hectare, so it's like about 68 or so acres. Um, What's the price point on that, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, 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 on retail? And this is a $62 retail wow. bottle of wine. Okay. All right, so next we're going to be uh, revealing uh, A. A. Wine A. And uh, uh, one A, Stephen, you love it. Uh, Joe, you don't like it. So you love it, white. Is seventeen a love it? The what? Is seventeen a love? Yeah, that, that's, well, a, I, that's a love. That's the price of that, love that, these that, days. Seventeen. Like <laughs> um, you know, I I I did like this one. I, you know, I I thought that um, that that the white flight, the two, the first two whites had had uh, a purity of fruit and an acid balance that I liked a lot. Right. Um, there was um, there was interesting for me um, uh, body to this wine, viscosity in the mouth of this wine. There was an aromatic signature that reminds me of a particular variety when it's grown in Livermore. Um, what do you guess it is? I, I, well, I I put down Semillon. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I'm I, God. Who, who knows? But it reminds me of, of that kind of grape. The, the special right, so we get. But you like you don't like it white. No, I don't. Know. To me, personally, not enough acidity and um, um, very short finish. What, uh, what, what varietal do you think it is? Yeah. I, I, I will go to Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc? Mm. A is... Something. Perla de Garda, Lugana de Ossi. Perla. The, 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 the what is that? I'm sorry. I <laughs> 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 oh, says it looks like Colt 45, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try that. Delicious. But, but, but it's on the back here, and I can also, people can uh, grab the bottle and try it. So, yeah, see what's the actual variety? On that so, one? what so is it? This yeah. is. Okay. Perla del Garda is another family owned estate at the south end of Lake Garda, the Lake District of Northern okay. Italy, the Lombardia sure. area. The grape varietal is Trebbiano di Lugana. So is it? it's Trebbiano. Oh, yeah. It's their own selection Trebbiano. and it's grown in limestone, wow. stony soils at the south end of the lake there. Mm -hmm. Which is not too far from George Clooney's house, although he's. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like Trebbiano. Trebbiano. Dirty right now. Put this on the side here yeah, so people can. Uh, That's so. interesting. All right, so uh, next one we're going to go with is uh, wine B. So wine B, that's a good score. So, I mean, I get a 15, I get a 17, I get a 15, you know, that's, a, that's pretty good. So um, I haven't heard from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, that's a, a one of your favorite. Uh, seven points, you know, tell me uh, why you like it. I just really love the nose. I actually kind of thought it was flabby, but I absolutely love the nose and I'm such an aromatic person. So um, it got like a perfect score in it. That's the world I wasn't thinking for. <laughs> and, um, but um, I, I did think it had a really good aftertaste or finish as some of us. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I just, I really enjoy the nose. It's got like, it's a little bit tropical. It's a little bit mineral. It's a little bit stony. Right. Like it's just, mm -hmm. for me, that's what wine's about. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with uh, um, Stephen. So 15 or why not 16 or 17? I couldn't dance to it. No? Mm -mm. What do you mean by that? I don't know. I just, made, dance just it? made it up. Um, I, I, you know, I, it, I like the wine. I, I like the it wine. It shows I, like it. I mean, yeah. I, I, um, I, I thought there was a, uh, an interesting carry through um, structurally with the wine. You know, it, it, for me, the, the fruit component seemed like it might be slightly sweet. There might be a sweetness there, and it finished extremely dry. Is it like residual sugar? Uh, yes, you'd ex you, I would expect residual sugar on the finish, given how candied the fruit note seemed to me. And there was a floral and fruit note component, kind of a matrix together that that. Is that, that bad in residual sugar wine? Not necessarily. Okay. Not not in the, not in the wines that are meant to have residual sugar. Right. Cabernet, it's a bad thing. Okay. Um, would you guess the the the, the varietal? 
Uh, it's white. That's right. It's a good start. It's like it is white. It's like you know. Seems like you know the song. You know, that's the summer he is. You know, I I I said Viognier. Viognier. Okay. How about you? Uh, I'm in the Alsatian category somewhere. Like there's like some dry gewurz in there with some Pinot Gris, maybe some Riesling, like a five star or something. Yes, first I was going, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, Gebert and things, aromatic well, that's why I wanted to say. <laughs> um, but, you know, I get this aromatic and everything, I, I really enjoy the wine. And I, I went, I will go to Albarino. Oh. Joel, you oh. nailed it! Oh, no way! Say the words you choose. Elder <laughs> I, I'm yesterday. terrible at this game. <laughs> That's the word. Well done. Well done, right? Thank you. So, um... We have to believe the next two things he says, right? <laughs> well, no, no, I, no I, I got everything. Uh, next one we're going to go is... Wine C. So, do you, yeah, you mind like a passing this bottle outside yeah. here so people can try? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, please. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to jump. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm going through that, you know? Yeah, so. Uh, this is one of the aspects of our company. Besides importing and distribution, we also broker local California brands. Um, this is an exciting new project by a colleague, a wine professional that we've known for many years, Boris Guillaume. Boris Guillaume. When Boris put his... The loudest wine taster actually on the record <laughs> in North America. <laughs> Please continue. When Boris put his concept together about making stylized versions of wines that he loves, he hired Helen Keplinger, who's one of the great winemakers of our generation, to make his wines. So he's a very lucky guy to be working with Helen. He's got a great vision of what he wants to do with his wines, and this is his first release of his wonderful Waterfall Cellars Albarino. Those fish on the label? They are. They're koi. And there's a Japanese legend about the koi that were jumping, trying to get over the waterfall. After trying for a hundred years, I think it was, one of them got over, and when it did, it turned into a beautiful dragon. Wow. Wow. It is. What's the price point? This is a $30 retail. Hmm. Is that expensive or, uh, or inexpensive for Alfred as a, as a brand? I think if you're talking about... Um, Consgard, which is much more expensive, I think. Um, this is, as an entry first release, it's an excellent value. And when you look at the people behind it with Boris and Helen, it's something you have to have. Do you often compare yourself to John Consgard? I didn't do that. Okay, excellent. <laughs> what, was right. the, what was the price point on the Trebbiano? Trebbiano? Uh, I'm sure we paid for Trebbiano. That was. I um, paid 18, 20 bucks. Twenty-one dollars. Cool. Yeah, With tax. Yes. Huh? <clears throat> yeah. All right. So let's move on to uh, wine number. This is the C. And uh, well, S Stephanie loved it. Joel, you really loved it. Stephanie, not so much. So I'm gonna start with you, Stephanie. Um, I really got turned off again. Going back to like, I'm like, <coughs> such a nose freak. The nose was just way too yeasty when I first got to it. it it's really opening up differently now. Um, I think texture it was really pleasing. It had a great finish. I gave it a two maximum for overall impression. I think for me it was just that that nose when we probably had it really cold and it got it was just really bready. Um, I also wouldn't drink this kind of wine on a day to day basis. This is more of a special occasion wine for me maybe. Like, but um, overall it's pretty interesting. Like I'm enjoying smelling it a lot more now. Joy, you loved it? Yes, I like the body of this wine. It's really bodacious. Um, you know, the acidity and everything I see is well balanced. It's, it's a powerhouse. You know, it's a big white. Uh, I like the yeastiness. Is Britannia you know, Wine Seas a flaw in wine or is it, is it embraced? Is it what? Is that a flaw in wine or, or do people actually do it on purpose so that it adds a certain nuance to the wine? I have the feeling they do it on purpose. Yeah. Some people well, do it on purpose. Yeah, I don't really think it's really, it's really natural, but you so know. You, you love the kind of wine in your cellar? <laughs> no, it's it's a, we talk about this a lot too at the winery. Uh, it's a cultural practice, I think, yeah. in most of the old world. It's what you grew up with. Your father made it. Wines that had that. Your grandfather mm -hmm. cellars were generally not very clean. Mm -hmm. Cooperage was very old. In California, it's definitely a flaw in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way to control it really. So yeah, it's so sterile, though. I mean, like you know, it's just uh, it's 
you're trying to uh, create your own culture but every, uh, having everything like really sterile. I mean, like, I actually, I, I, I understand what you're saying and it's an interesting point. I, I, I like a little bit of funk, you know. So how you get but, that then? Well, you, you taste somebody's wine who's got funk in it. Oh, know? that's right. So <laughs> not yours. No, not mine. <laughs> I mean, it's right. I mean, it's it's just it's not you know again a cultural practice in in California right. uh, is that that's that's a that's no bueno. You know, you I don't, you don't know. because who says you, that, it's though? who uh, who says that most of the press. Most of the winemakers oh, I know. Them. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So, like, look, you know, uh, so this is like, you know, uh, this most is, of my customers. See, see, no, 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 no. That's like, oh, but, you know, okay. Uh, what, what do you think it is? What do you think it is? Um, Oops, excuse me. I think it's a Chard. The what? Chardonnay. Okay. What do you think it is, Stephanie? Yeah, I'm about there. Yeah. Yeah, that's my guess. California, yeah, like, where is it from? I mean, like, you know, France or like, you know, Australia or. Chile or what? What? Mm, I will. Uh, Peru. That, that's a good point. That's not. I don't think. It's, I don't think Cleaver. it's the old world. <laughs> I think it's new world. It might not be uh, California, but I, I will go. Hmm. California. Okay. What about you? Yeah. Uh, no. I'm California. thinking. I'm thinking it's California. I think it's. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's, How about you? It seems like it, there's there's a fair amount of acid. There's, for my taste, too yeah. much wood in the nose, yeah. mm. but really pretty, you know, body mm -hmm. body through the mouth. I, I think it's a cool climate, California somewhere, Sonoma coast somewhere, Sonoma. Yeah. Um, but it seems I like California. Sure, I'm sure you pay for it. Uh, how much did I pay for it? Would I, you, or do you think it is? Well, I don't know. It's just how like, much? You know, tell me, like, you know, by the taste, you know, the, the, the varietal has nothing to do. with I, it. It's probably expensive. It's so probably much. 40 bucks 40 plus. Bucks? Yeah, I'm thinking it's probably 55 bucks or so. 50 bucks. I don't pay for one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I drink with you more, more often? <laughs> you got my car, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how much do you pay? If you well, have to pay. Uh, yeah, I will pay in the 40s. Yeah. 40s? Yeah. 40s? Mm -hmm. All right. And this is a new St. George. <gasps> oh, oh, no, we wow. suck. Really? <laughs> Please, we so, ahead. Which this vintage? Is, uh, this is a very rare one. Yeah, um, no. How fornicated do we say George, huh? <laughs> I don't we get, got Chardonnay. I don't I get mean. the California thing in this wine. But um, Joel, Joel, you should go with your heart when you like a wine that's going to be French. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is quite rare, a Nuit Saint Georges Blanc. Yeah. Um, it's from a producer called Domaine Dublair. Um, interesting story, this is a domain, one of the few in Burgundy that's owned by an American. He was a political journalist and actually a White House news correspondent that loved Burgundy. He went and made wine with Patrice Rion and uh, Jean-Marc Pilot, was able to buy a little piece of property in sauvigny les bones and now he's able to buy grapes from incredible vineyards. This is quite rare and it's $93 a bottle retail. Oh, I can get you to the rodeo for fourteen dollars if you want to smoke Bertano Mayas. I wouldn't have thought to say All right, so uh, next one we're gonna go I don't think I've with. Ever had uh, uh, I don't think I've had one. Next one we're gonna go with F. Can I have F, please? <clears throat> F. Okay, F. Uh, Joel, you know you loved it. Almost no, twenty. That. That's, that was in nineteen seventy. Does everyone get a trophy here, Stif Joel? Stif 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 <laughs> Stephanie, that was you know the opposite. I mean, you know, that that was your lowest rank. No, no, the no. second lowest ranking. Yeah. So all right. So uh, Joel, you love it. Why? Why? Because it was so complex. I, I had a hard time figuring it out. Uh, but you know, I same thing. I like the you know the body. I like the finish. Uh, on this wine, uh, again, a wine that I will enjoy with a grill, you know, cowboy cut. You get the, uh, the, 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 the varietal, the blending, or the... Uh, and the, um, the, give me the vintage too, me as well. The, <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like in the Kolish movie, right? That's, uh, okay, now, um, I, I want to go to Tempanil, um, and... You know, uh, you I will. Tempranillo. Tempranillo. Excellent. Uh, I will go with uh, a Tempranillo and I would say uh, 2012 vintage, maybe. All right. Uh, uh, how much you pay for it? Mm. 
How much? I'm going to try to pay for it. I pay $60 for that. $60? Okay. How about you? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to go with Stephanie. Yeah. Um, there's just a pruny kind of quality to this wine that um, I, I didn't care for. Um, I still think great bright acidity. Um, I just, uh, flavor profile wise, it's not the style of wine I typically drink. I'm thinking Italy. Um, I am thinking Italy. Not definitely out of northern Italy, maybe more towards central, even Sicily. I don't know. But I, I felt there was something um, we had maybe thought about, maybe some carbonic or something going on. I don't know. Maybe I don't feel the same way now. But there's just something um, in the aromatics and the prune thing, that, that Coca-Cola thing, that I, it's not what I drink normally. What do you think? I'm going to say 2010, maybe a Gottenar or something, probably at 45 bucks. I'm 45 bucks, okay. How about you, Sim? I like the wine a lot more now than than I did when I first tasted it. There's really neat structure to the wine, a lot of lot of tannin in the wine. There's some interesting dried fruit notes that I, short of prune, but dried fruit that that's really interesting to me. Um, I, I'm gonna say old world. I don't drink enough old world wines, so Italian would would maybe seem appropriate to me. Um, but I, I think a relatively young wine that I, will age well, and I, I'm like you know like. 2010, 2011, uh, You know, 2000, well, I nine. mean, there are probably wines in the marketplace, <laughs> so I'm going to say 2010, 11, somewhere yeah. in that neighborhood. How much you pay for it? Um, how much should I pay for it? I would pay, I would pay 45 to 60 for it, I guess, somewhere okay. in that neighborhood. Wouldn't surprise me if it were more expensive than that, but... Harris, <laughs> 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 I, dr I drink a lot of these. Uh, <laughs> <here>. <laughs> a ringer. Tell us about this wine. It makes me happy yeah. that everyone thinks it's old world. Uh, that's something I like to try to achieve. The fact that it's 2007 and it hasn't actually been released yet. Um, really? It's an upcoming cool. release in June. It's a Reserva Cuvée, which I kept in barrel for three years and in bottle for five more, so I release it after eight years from the harvest. It's gonna be $57 retail. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And it's 64% um, Cabernet, 36% Tempranillo. Nice, Ooh. pretty pretty, pretty wine. Mm. Really cool. Why, why hold oh. on to it so long? Well, your own personal preference? Mm -hmm. I like to push the envelope of what's considered a reserve wine. But when you release it, you think you should go bottle the table in terms of you right. release it because it's not instead of holding up the, right. the other I, retailers I, or restaurants to age it for you. Like, exactly. Yeah, I don't okay. understand why more winemakers don't do that. And it's called cash flow, Steve. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why you have a distribution company on the side. <laughs> What's the production level on that wine? 120 or 100, let's see, what is it? 117 cases. Nice. Ooh, that's really and, cool. And the last one we're going to be revealing is Wine D, the winner of the uh, the, the competition. Um, uh, it has a very tight. I was like a, um, a 18, 17, 18. That's great. So uh, you guys are all agree on this one here. Um, what, what was so special? I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Stephen. Um, again, you know, what I what I liked about the wine was I didn't know really what it was. I, mean, I had some guesses as to what it was, um, but um, it was it was a great structure of the wine again. You know, really interesting aromatic notes, some some tea, some rose, some some really neat wine, uh, neat aromatics, great flavor. I thought great structure throughout the wine. Nice nice length to the wine. Um, I just I thought it was a delicious wine. You guess the uh, guess in the grape. Not yet. Okay. Wait till Joel tells me. Uh, <laughs> I'll agree with him. He probably is tasting it. He tasted it on Tuesday. <laughs> You're like, you know, uh, the, your highest, you know, rating with uh, a... Yeah, this is, my, yeah. this is my wheelhouse. It's soft. It's Ooh. um, it's pretty. It's that tea, those great aromatics, the little cedar, and like just, uh, just that perfect amount of fruit and um, acid and... Easy drinking. Clearly, I my my vote has been all night for the wines that are a little bit more easy drinking. And I again, I'm like for whatever reason, I drink a lot of Italian wine at home. This wine feels really familiar, and I'm saying something in Italy for that reason. Maybe more like a Barbera or something. Like that. Okay, and uh, uh, Joel. Yeah, that's really, really interesting what you say because when I, I tried, I mean, I you know I like the wine a lot. Uh, I would have that with some a nice quail, you know, and a little slab of foie gras with it. Um, I when, <laughs> oh. you know, on the nose, <laughs> I, I was going, as you say, like Nebbiolo, you know, Piemonte, Northern Italy. Uh, 
But then I, I look at uh, the rim, looking at the wine. You know, I, I was thinking maybe Grenache. So I went with the Grenache. But you might be right with the Barbera. But I went with the Grenache. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, all like right, so I'm going to reveal that, you know, but, uh, you know, you're going to mm. tell us the, the price point. Mm. But, uh, um, oh, hey, Zin, New World or Old World? Um, I say Old Zin, World. Old World? No. New World or Old World? I'm thinking Old World. Old World? I, I want to say it's Old World. Okay. Are you ready for Old World? Oh. So. Can you hear me on this mic now? Yeah, oh, cool. Joel is amazing tonight. This is, he's, he's this is a wine from Sardinia called Cananao de Sardinia, which is a synonym for Grenache. Ladies and gentlemen. No I'm kidding. Come on. <laughs> go away. Go away. <laughs> um, actually, they believe that Grenache originated from the island of Sardinia. And this is a producer named Gabas. This is their Reserva wine from the 2010 vintage, which was declared a Tre Bicchieri winner, um, which is considered one of the best wines of Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, Sardinia uh, Reserva, is that two years in oak, three years in oak? What's the, what's the Barrique uh, uh, protocol? I believe it's two. Two years, thank you. Awesome. I don't know how you get a Grenache. Uh, mm -hmm. shit, I, mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, that's tight though. I mean, it's like, what's the vintage? 2010. 2010. Wow. I had Nebbiolo written down too, and I had Barberas and Note kind of. Just because the, I never the had this rose, but then when I look at the yeah. one, I, I never I, had this uh, expression. I'm like, like, yeah. You know, I say, okay, it cannot be because when so I look at I, the. I, 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 I'm rim. jealous of restaurateurs because they get to taste so many different <laughs> things. Okay. We, we are pretty much enough. So, what, what, what do you think of the, uh, the portfolio? Pretty good? Oh, yes. you like it? Really yeah. nice one. Yeah. yeah, love it. By the yeah. way, that, you know, that wine, that wine uh, yeah. retails for forty dollars. Yeah. Forty bucks. Forty yeah. bucks. Yeah. Can we buy? Nice. Do you have a website that we can buy some on tonight? <laughs> we do not sell retail. We're only no. wholesale. Only wholesale. You buy from me. Okay. I'm pressing order like a twenty we pieces. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Number one retailer. In the I mean, in terms of like the wines that you the taste, young tonight, who would say is a retailer in the I love it. I could drink that wine all day. But the, of all six, partial of the six? Uh, they're I'm scattered in the right? Excellent, I mean, excellent answer. What do you people there? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 was, that, that was a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that was really like interesting. Really, words, uh, yeah. Yeah. Really, 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 very different really than what we usually test here in Napa Valley. The last word for, for uh, uh, my good friend, uh, friend uh, Christopher. Christopher, any like, uh, particular topic you want to touch on? Or are like, you all cool? Well, you know, I'm going to say something. When we talk about old world, new world, um, you know, we talked a little bit about Britannomyces. Would you say the old world embraces BA more than the new world, or is that something volatile acidity is something that has become more accepted in American wines as, a, as an acceptable flaw? It's just, I'm fascinated that the old world, what we would look at as a, as a flaw in wines, is embraced as a stylistic choice uh, in the old world. Let's, um, let's do the, like, you know, the, 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 the last answers, two minutes each. You have two minutes, you have two minutes, you have two minutes. <laughs> this is the last thing. Um, that's a really good question too. I mean, there there are legal limits in the U.S. for VA, and again, we we I would I look at it as a as something we need to guard against. You know, things that we would do early on in fermentation to try to make sure that it's not a problem. Uh, topping barrels, obviously, as the wines age, that sort of thing. You know, keeping keeping our hands on the wine. Exactly. Uh, you know, but you know, the sixty or the forty-seven Cheval Blanc, right, was was way way out of what would be legal limits if there were such a thing then in VA and it's regarded as the greatest wine ever made. So again, I think culturally it's it's one of those things that so you're saying the greatest wine ever made was flawed. Absolutely. I think I Wait, think that on, I think that most people would say it's flawed. Yeah. It was a very hot vintage for, for France too, but it was one of those things that it, everything worked together. It's it's a flaw but if it's in balance, it's like it's like Brett. You know, the Brett in and of itself is a flaw. Uh, but if it's in balance of anything else, it adds interest and adds it, it, it elevates certain things and makes wine more complex and interesting, which is and delicious, which is what we're really after. See if any. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the East Coast, so my threshold for tolerance for flaws in wine, I think, is greatly higher than people that are their first impressions of wine are only in California. Like I couldn't afford Californian wines back you know, five years ago when I turned 21. And I would go to the store and I would buy these amazing Riojas and Italian wines. Um, you know, 
Brett is how Justin started. We, uh, me being a New Yorker, my partner being uh, British, we wanted to make wines that were similar to French style. Public, like the public, made us change our styles of wine. That being said, I have four barrels of 2010 that had Brett, and they are stored at our custom crush facility. If you're interested in coming by and tasting them for a fifty dollar fee, I'm more than happy to give you that experience because we can't bottle it. Um, but look at fashion, look at art, look at the Mona Lisa, look at different socio-economic uh, cultures and what they think of as beautiful. Here in the United States, we have crafted these ultra pure, rich, ripe acid-free, fruit-forward, maybe alcohol bombs because of what we were raised as Coca-Cola kids with our palates. And so, but that being said, like I said, when I go home at night, what do I want to drink? I want to drink some dirty Italian wine or probably some funky Pinot. And on good occasions, some great Bordeaux. All right, um, you want to let have it. Yeah. <laughs> you love it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with uh, the rest of the panel, you know, that, uh, but, and it's a question of culture. I mean, if you look at the Vengeance du Jura, you know, the oxidation, and, uh, which is in the wine, and that's part of the wine, that's part of, of what it is, and that's what makes the wine special as well. So what some people call a flow can be appreciated by some other palate. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Steve, Did you yeah. Yeah, okay. for the lineup tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You got me on the Trebbiano. I need to drink more of that. Mm -hmm. we need to, uh, and you don't see a lot of Trebbiano, I think, you know, even uh, around the valley or in the restaurant as you know, uh, single varietal like that. So that was a very interesting one. You just opened a new account in San Francisco. <laughs> big, yes. big, big buyer. Yes. No. no, I mean, uh, Trebbiano, Trebbiano with Japanese food, definitely, yes. You know, with yeah. the sashimi. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, delicious. All right, Christopher, do the closing. Steve, thank you very much. I think you did really well tonight. Uh, how, how did you, uh, you feel about the way the wine showed? Here's a question for you, Steve. Temperature. How do you actually get each one of these wines to show at the right temperature? Is that a major factor in how people enjoy this wine? Well, it's certainly a factor, and I talk to my staff a lot about how to present wines and how you have to have a when cool... When you say your staff, you mean the people that work for you, correct? That's right. Yes, please continue. Um. <laughs> 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 um, you must carry a cooler with blue ice and keep the wines at a good temperature. Way to end the show. <laughs> What's the temperature for drinking wine? Whites and reds, same temperature, or is there a different temperature for both? Yeah, I think cellar temperature for reds and cooler for whites. What does whites. cellar temperature mean to the rest of people in the world? 55 degrees. So you drink your reds at 55 degrees? If possible. Outstanding. How about your whites? Cooler and then champagne even colder. Okay. Outstanding. Um, what's the future say for you as we, as we, as we close this entire experience up? Um, what's the, how do people attach themselves to what you're doing and to go find your wines out in the world? What's the best path to find these wines out there? Well, Is there we a website have, they can go for yours that will track them to where to find the wines? No, no. I think okay. um, awesome. we're very <laughs> into it. Um, who works for, um, your marketing department just called. They all quit, actually, yeah. Um, if you, if you are dining around Napa Valley and happen to see a back label that says imported by Vintage Wine Marketing, that's us. Um, or Parador, of course, enjoys a lot of local support and even around California. Um, the future, I think, well, in the immediate future for us is Portugal. We're working on bringing some very exciting wines in from Portugal and I visited there in March, and it's definitely something that's going to be happening. The dry wine is not the port. Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank I want to thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I got to say, I think we had a great panel uh, uh, for the tasting uh, this week. I was uh, very impressed. Joel, as usual, the gold trophy once again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning uh, in tonight, and uh, we hope you join us next time. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.